listeners. Welcome to Grief Out Loud. Remember the last time you tried to talk about grief and suddenly everybody left the room? Grief Out Loud is opening up this often avoided conversation because grief is hard enough without having to go through it alone. We bring you a mix of personal stories, tips for supporting children, teens, and yourself, and interviews with professionals in the grief world. Platitude and cliche-free, we promise. Grief Out Loud is hosted by me, Jana DeCristofero, and produced by Dougie Center, the National Grief Center for Children and Families in Portland, Oregon. Hey listeners, this episode is the second of three we'll be releasing this year that highlight the voices of communities who have historically been, and continue to be, underrepresented in the grief world. This conversation explores the Autism and Grief Project, a new online platform designed to help adults with autism navigate and cope with the complexities of grief that arise from death and non-death loss. The Autism and Grief Project website was created by the Hospice Foundation of America in partnership with the NLM Family Foundation. This episode, and the entire series, is part of an ongoing collaboration between Dougie Center and the New York Life Foundation. We're deeply grateful for New York Life Foundation's tireless support of and advocacy for children and teens who are grieving. And don't worry, while this sounds like it could be a very technical, logistical conversation about the Autism and Grief Project, I promise it's anything but. And that's because I had the honor of talking with Alex Lamori. He's a member of the project's advisory board, who brought to the work both his lived experience as an adult with autism and someone who has had many, many experiences with loss in his life. Alex has had his father, his grandparents, a beloved nanny, and his dog Shadow die. We were also joined by Dr. Kenneth J. Doka, the Senior Vice President of Grief Programs at Hospice Foundation of America, and also a member of the Autism and Grief Project development team. Dr. Doka brings years of professional experience to the work and his personal reflections on grief to the conversation. I want to make a quick note about language. The Autism and Grief Project uses both identity first, autistic adults, and person first, adults with autism, in recognition of how these identifying terms are such a personal choice, and the use of both styles is reflected in our episode. Okay, here's our conversation. Alex, Dr. Doka, thank you for coming on Grief Out Loud today and being part of the conversation. Of course, thank you for having me. Uh, delighted to be on. Thank you very much for, for allowing me to be on. So, so listeners can get a chance to know you and get uh, familiar with your voices. I'd love if you could just each introduce yourselves with anything you want to share about who you are. And Alex, would, would you like to start us? I would love to. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm 23 years old and I'm an adult with autism who has suffered many instances of grief in my life. Thank you, Alex. How about you, Dr. Doka? Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Doka, uh, Kenneth J. Doka. I've done a lot of writing in the last 50 years about grief and loss, um, and I'm a retired professor and senior vice president of the Hospice Foundation of America. As, um, as vice president, I was on the advisory board for the Autism and Grief Project, um, and that's who I am. Thank you both for being here today. And, uh, you know, because it's Grief Out Loud and we are going to talk maybe a little bit more about the professional aspects of uh, working with folks who have autism and are grieving and kind of way things that we should know about how to best show up for people in that way. But it's so important to just kind of root our conversation in the personal as well. So I'm wondering, Alex, you mentioned that you'd had a number of losses in the last couple of years. Would you want to share a little bit about your personal connection to grief? Yes, of course. So for me, uh, I was brought on board as an advisory member for the Autism and Grief Project. And basically, I lost a lot of people during my very formative years. During major formative years of my life, I lost my late father when I was six, my grandparents and beloved family nanny when I was 15, 16, back to back. And then I lost my step-grandmother uh, just very recently and my dog Shadow, who had been with me since I was a kid. So that was that death was particularly difficult for me as it was 
it was a, an example of anticipatory grief because I knew that she was sort of nearing the end and it was difficult to lose a piece of my childhood like that. Because Shadow had been with you through so many of those other experiences with grief as well. Exactly. Alex, this is maybe a strange question, but how did Shadow support you when you were grieving those other people who had died? Well, my dad died when I was six, and my mom and us got Shadow when I was four. So she died in, I believe, 2017, 2018, around that time. So she was there for the deaths of of my nanny, my grandparents, my grandfather, my father. So it was honestly just her companionship that really sort of helped me get through it all. She was 15 and a half. She was a German shepherd and she troopered through the average German shepherd lifespan. It was impressive, really. And Alex, I know you were six when your dad died. Is there anything you remember about him that you'd want to share today? Honestly, it's all secondhand accounts from mom and other family members, letters, videos. It's I don't have any direct memories of him. Dr. Doka, I know you've been writing about grief for 50 plus years, but is there a personal connection you felt open to sharing today? Oh, well, of course, at, at 76 years old, um, certainly experienced my share of losses. Um, I've, I've lost friends. I've lost a sibling. My older brother, Frank, died a number of years ago. My parents have obviously died. Um, a year ago, uh, my partner, Kathy, uh, died. So I've had my own personal experiences of, of death. But what actually got me involved in the field was when I was 23, I had what was called a clinical pastoral education experience at Sloan Kettering, which is a major cancer hospital in New York. And I was working with children who had cancer. Uh, and of course, Sloan Kettering in those days got the most, still but still today, gets the most serious cases. And, um, and most of the k- kids that I worked with um, died either during the course of the summer or subsequently. So I've certainly had a lot of experience. Um, and I think that was the first time, you know, you, you got close to these kids. Um, and, and that was the first time I had, I guess, what you might say is significant grief. And certainly um, this experience served as my introduction to the field. Uh, from it, I was going to Concordia Seminary and I wrote a, a master's level thesis on the pastoral um, pastoral counseling to the dying child and his family. And then I was doing a sociology degree at the same time. And I did a study called the, the Social Organization of Terminal Care in Two Pediatric Hospitals. Both of them got published, and I found myself sort of in what I would call the second generation of people who were doing work in the field. So many, many personal experiences, but really kind of coming into this field rooted in that professional interweaving with personal of getting so close to those kids that you were supporting and then navigating the grief of their yeah. families, their grief, and your own grief in that. Well, actually, yeah, I, I used to say when I would reflect on the experience that I spent in my thir- a third of my time working with children, a third of the time working with their parents, and a third of the time working with the nursing staff, who also experienced grief because naturally, um, you would take they were taking care of these kids for a long time, and and they got very close to them, and their deaths affected the staff, uh, all of us um, as well. Yeah. I was going to say, we need one more third, Dr. Doka, for you to be caring for yourself in that work as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we, we may may make that fa- the fact uh, the fraction fourth. So. so in getting ready for this conversation with both of you, I was thinking that, you know, at this point, I feel like many people are maybe have heard the word autism, have heard the concept of autism spectrum, but just wondering, like, for each of you, what do you think is important for listeners to know about autism as we come into this conversation about the, you know, the overlap of autism and grief? Well, if I can start on this one, um, I think the most important thing to remember is when we talk about it, we are talking about a spectrum. And I always like what uh, one colleague, Dr. Stephen Shore says, if you've met one person with autism, uh, you met one person with autism. So I think it's important to realize that on the spectrum, people vary greatly. Uh, from people who um, who are are functioning very well in society, and and some of whom uh, some of whose friends might even be aware unaware that they're on the spectrum, 
um, because the disability is so slight uh, to others who are highly disabled, who are non-speaking and who, who may be experiencing greater issues in functioning. So I think the key thing to remember is it is a spectrum and as a spectrum, it is a very wide spectrum. And how individual it is. Yeah, and a lot of variation within that spectrum. How about you, Alex? What would you want to add to that? Well, I'd like to add that I equate what uh, Dr. Stephen Schwartz quote about autism to grief as well. When you've met one person who's grieving, you've met one person who's grieving. We all grieve in our very unique, different ways. And it's the same, the same thing with autism. Autism often it's very it's a spectrum it varies so like dr dota said the symptoms vary from person to person and so for but for example many people individuals with autism or grieving might uh might have uh complicated emotional responses for example with my step-grandmother i had a i don't know i had a very complicated emotional response to that and it was i realized that because of that emotional response i did not feel mentally well enough to go to her funeral and so it's the same for many other individuals with autism it's just it's you've met one person who's grieving you've met one person who's grieving it's uh, yeah yeah and so to combine those two it's if you've met one person with autism who's grieving you've met one person with autism exactly. who's grieving Alex, can I ask a question about, and you can say pass if you don't want to answer this, but I was thinking you said you had a really complicated emotional reaction or response to your step-grandmother's death. What what types of feelings were in that mix for you? Honestly, for me, I wasn't real. I didn't have that much of a connection with her. She lived in Indiana. She died in Indiana. And I only saw her like once or twice a year. So for me, it was difficult because I'm a very compassionate person. I love very deeply. And when I felt this, honestly, lack of reaction to her death, I was confused. And we've talked about, uh, Dr. Doctor and I have talked about in the past how there are, you know, you're not, like I said, we all grieve uniquely. So you're not supposed to grieve one particular way. And so I was confused Mom and I were, mom and I had a deep talk about it. I was confused as to why I felt like I wasn't, I should be, I felt like I should be crying my eyes out, should be on my knees sobbing and praying to God for her back. But it was just more of nothing. And I think mom talked, mom and I talked, and she said it was a mix of having to suffer from so many previous losses, as well as uh, not having that good of a connection with her. And it sort of created this, opposite sort of lack of reaction for me. Which felt really confusing, it sounds like. Exactly. It was confusing. I'm like, I know I'm supposed to, I, sh- I feel like I should be crying, but I'm not. And so I was confused. Alex, I'm curious, what do you remember about finding out about the deaths that you've experienced? So for my father, I, you know, I don't remember directly being told. I think the most significant memory I have with my father related to my father's death is, um, well, my mom told me, but I don't really remember that conversation. That was years ago, but I believe the most significant memory I have regarding the early days after his death was when I went to back to school and they, uh, they announced over the loudspeakers that he had died. For me, that stuck with me for a while. In regards to my grandparents' death, one of that one actually had a very significant impact on my social life. I was in the middle of high school, and I went to a specialized high school for those with special needs. And one of the things they had in the school was summer school. And so, because both my grandparents died in the summertime, June, July, uh, June, July, August, I was mom was constantly taking me out of school to go to New York and it ended up causing a lot of stress on my grades. And so it was something that I then had to put a lot of overworking into catching up on those lost grades. My grandmother, since this was relatively fresh, I remember I was um, going to a day program just to, you know, make some friends, do some activities, you know, go to the mall, all of that. And she had died in the middle of the program, but mom wanted to spare me any suffering. And so she did not call me until after 
the program had ended and I was on my way home. That was the most significant memories of uh, being told about their deaths. From my biological mm -hmm. grandmother, I just remembered something very significant. Um, my grandmother, my biological grandmother, I was the last person that she ever spoke words to. I was the last person she ever spoke to. And it sort of became like a blessing slash curse kind of thing. For me, I was blessed with that opportunity. But for someone who I suffer from guilt a lot, so I felt guilty. I felt like I had robbed people who deserved it more of that that blessing, that gift. But over time, I've been able to come to terms with it and realize that it's a gift, not a curse, to have that final interaction with her. But it felt like at the beginning, like, oh, somehow I took this opportunity away from somebody else who should have had the last conversation with her. Exactly. Dr. Doka, you know, we talked a little bit about this at the beginning, knowing that grief is so individual for everyone and that where people are on the autism spectrum is so different for everyone. In that, I always ask the impossible question, are, are there some commonalities for how people with autism might react to loss and or express their grief? Well, um, I, I think the important thing to remember is that when we're grieving and, and a person is grieving with autism, um, often a, autism affects people's social interactions, the way they communicate, uh, especially if they're non-speaking, um, but how they might display emotions. And, and this, may, this may make it difficult for people without autism or autistic persons to, to deal with it in, in a lot of different ways. Other people may find their reactions somewhat off-putting uh, because they're not easily understood. Uh, I had one client who was a young adult with autism, and whenever she was nervous, she would giggle. And so here she's talking about her dad's death. And she's saying things to the effect of, well, you know, my 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 dad died uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. And then she'd giggle. And, and you know, and I'm sure for somebody who didn't understand the circumstances and saw an adult talking this way, it would they might have perceived that as very strange and, and very unusual. Other people may be non-emotive. Again, what we've got to remember, we're dealing with two spectrums here. <laughs> the autism spectrum and the and the spectrum of people reacting to grief. But I, I think the biggest issue is um, issues in, in emotional expression and issues in communication that can really um, maybe cause confusion in others as to how these people, uh, how these people who are autistic are reacting to the death. And, and it may come across um, as inappropriate to some, to some people. Mm. Not matching with maybe what the stereotype or the social expectation is. Yeah, what the norms are, certainly. And, and I think that's why this website is so important, because it, you know, provides that information in an area that we haven't really delved into much. We have some material on, on autism um, uh, and grief with children, but this is, I think, a pioneering effort to provide some resources for adults with autism and for, for people who are, whether they're clergy or professionals or parents, who are de dealing with adults who are autistic. Well, thank you, Dr. Duggan. I know we're going to go more into detail about the Autism and Grief Project, but Alex, I wanted to come back over to you for a moment and just ask, what do you think has been helpful for you in your grief? Well, for me, it was I finally identifying my specific and unique way of grieving. For me, my unique way of grieving is taking my feelings and my thoughts and molding them into characters and then using those characters in uh, imaginary scenarios to help take out these emotions and deal with them in my mind. That's mainly what's helped with my grief, but also having a very strong support system and consistent support system as well. And really just a lot of you know, training, you know, therapy, a lot of help over the years. Mom, one of the greatest lessons my mother ever taught me was that it's never a bad thing to ask for help. Therapy, taking medication, all of it. It's never a bad thing to ask for help. Seems like uh, many of us could benefit from talking to your mom and getting that message that it's okay to ask for help. And, and Alex, I'm you mentioned that what's helpful for you is you create characters and scenarios in your mind that kind of help give voice to your emotions or to make sense of them. How did you discover that practice? 
believe it or not, I was actually doing it subconsciously at first. I didn't actually really make that conscious connection until about 2022. I'd been doing it for years at that point. And it's interesting because some of these characters are just one-offs for that situations, but a lot of other characters I've created have actually stuck around in my head. And they end up becoming a lot of times my go-to characters for certain feelings or situations. Was there anything that didn't help you in your grief or you found was maybe hurtful or harmful in some way? Well, I guess when I guess when people like didn't give me my space or they didn't respect what I needed following the death, say I just wanted to delve into video games to distract myself for a couple of days, but people kept trying to drag me out of them. People disrupting my routine. Disruptions to routine is very is a, is a thing for just, not just for me, but for many individuals with autism. Structure routine. That's something that a very um, central characteristic for individuals with autism. And so disruption to my routines, especially during times of both grieving and, for example, my grandma and grandpa, biological ones, I my school routine was disrupted by the constant trips to New York and back while they were in hospice. And so that was extremely difficult for my grief at the time and because I was, it was my routine was constantly being ripped up and blah, 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 and all that. Yeah. So that was something that was very detrimental to my grief journey. So the routines are so helpful in kind of the the flow of every day and kind of keeping things at a certain place. And then during grief, which is already a pretty, can be an upsetting time to have that routine disrupted really took you away from the things that kept you maybe like more grounded. I did, yes. Uh, Like I said, it's routine structure. It's a very character, very standard or sort of central characteristic for a lot of uh, uh, individuals with autism. And so my best friend who's in, who's, you know, lives a couple hours away, he had his work, you know, his work job was his routine, get up, go to work, go home. And he was recently let go of it. And so it sort of created this void in his schedule that he's been slowly trying to adapt to. Were there ways that you found to adapt for me, it's, I just should say it's a little unique because I've um, not only had to deal with so many deaths in my life, but I've also moved a lot of times in my life. So those two particularly strong life events have given me and an ability, have helped hone an ability for me to adapt to new situations more so than um, a lot of other, you know, individuals with autism I've met. So I got... I guess you could say I've been lucky enough to be exposed to enough situations to learn how to adapt from a young age. So, Dr. Doka, I feel like maybe we should have started with this question because we're uh, a bit of a way through our conversation, but I'm wondering if you could introduce us more to the Autism and Grief Project that you referenced. Yeah, um, that was a, that was a wonderful project. It's, it really was a one-of-a-kind project with the uh, NLM Foundation. And, and what it tried to do was to help adults with autism navigate the complexities of grief um, that arise from both death and non-death situations. Um, we offer uh, stories about, about people grieving. We offer resources. We offer tools. Um, we call these social stories, links to other support systems and other, uh, other resources for support. And, and I think that's very, very critical because one of the things that I think the website does especially well um, is we recognize that people grieve individually and, and because they grieve individually, certain ways or certain suggestions for adaptation will work with some, but not necessarily work with the others. So what we try to do is, is to create a plethora of resources. So somebody might say, well, this really hasn't worked for, for me or, or my child, my adult child, but let me try this one. Um, so I think it, it really is an incredible project, uh, it really fills a gap in the literature and and really fills a, a need. Um, and so, uh, again, um, the H- HFA was proud to work with the NLM Foundation um, to really create this, I think, this very critical resource that offers people all kinds of ways uh, of understanding how autism and grief intersect 
and and acknowledges that there's lots of ways um, and lots of resources for coping um, and and pulls them all into one place. And I think it it's um, it was a delight and a joy to work on the project. And I think we've we've accomplished what's going to be a significant resource in the field. And Alex, can you tell us a little bit about your role in the Autism and Grief Project? Of course. My role was an advisory one, but it was also to help provide information from a sort of firsthand experience. So it was, you know, to provide my firsthand experiences on autism and grief and to sort of provide tips, pointers, and I guess overall material for the uh, for the website content, you could say. What was the experience like for you to be involved? It was honestly, it was an honor, to be honest. It was like, it was just, I don't know. It was just, yeah, it's the best way to explain it is it was an honor. It was like, it was nice and really cool to work with all these people and these people who understood, but also to work with my um, fellow advisory board members and just the purpose of doing something like this. My goal in life is to just help as many people as I can. So this was really one of the one of the ways I can fulfill that that desire of mine to help people. So it sounds like this project, Autism and Grief Project, is really focused on adults um, who are grieving, but also for professionals who are looking for support and resources as well. Do you want to say a little bit, Dr. Doka, just about like who might go to the website and what they might find if they go there? Sure. Well, as I said, the website is designed for three major audiences. Uh, persons who are on the spectrum, uh, autism spectrum, uh, parents of people who are on the autism spectrum, and clergy and other professionals who would be interacting with people on the spectrum. So, so I think that's a unique focus, that it's really a threefold focus. Um, and I think it provides, as I said, it provides um, information in various formats, which I think is particularly useful, uh, including little vignettes, personal vignettes, we call them social stories, that illustrate some of the points we're cognitively trying to make. Uh, so I, I think it includes lots of resources uh, presented in different ways. So, so I think it's incredibly uh, useful and, and does so much. Alex, I'm curious, in being involved in this project, is there anything that you've learned that's changed how you try to support, uh, say, a friend or a family member who's grieving? Yes, of course. So one of the things that helped me with that is my increase in grief literacy. That is, I've learned a lot more terms and acronyms and theories, research things regarding grief that I didn't know before, which really helped in uh, helping you know those who are others others who are grieving, whether they are whether they whether they're on, on the autism spectrum or not. That was really that helped you know to be able to verbalize the advice I'm trying to give in a more understandable way. Yeah. So being able to learn a lot more about grief, have more words to understand what's happening, has helped you figure out maybe how to be there for other people. Yes. And Dr. Doka, how about you? You've been in the field forever, but I'm wondering, is there anything that you've <laughs> learned in this project that's changed how you show up for people? Um, well, I've been in the field for a while. This has been a new learning for me. Um, and certainly it's changed. Uh, it, it's made me have a deeper understanding of autism. Uh, it's made me have a deeper understanding of the ways um, we we present and work with grieving people Um across you know all kinds of situations and issues so i i think it's it's been another event another experience that has sensitized me uh to the to the you know as i said to a universal idea that different people grieve in different ways and we have to take into account the whole person so it's been both reinforcing in in that way a lesson i've i've been working with you know most of my entire career but also learning some new learnings uh as um as I began to learn something about um, the issues that occur with people on the autism spectrum when they experience a loss, whether it's a death loss or a non-death loss. So as we come towards the end of our conversation, I was going to ask each of you, what are two things you would most want listeners to know about how to best support someone 
who's grieving and has autism? I, I think the first thing, of course, is be opening to li- be open to listening, be open to identifying feelings that might be might be difficult. So it may be helpful to ask what they think about the circumstances um, rather than how they feel, you know, to to be open to um, to using a variety of different languages. You know, the, the quintessential uh, counseling question, which which I often warn my students against is how did you feel about that? It's it's often better to maybe ask questions like how did you react, how did you respond, uh, how did you think about that, rather than how one feels. And and again, I think the the other lesson, which is a lesson we should learn uh, always, is to um, is to and, and and I you know and I I, I think Alex is, um, has had an important role on the advisory uh, committee because it's also reinforced our notion that we can't talk about people without talking with people. Uh, we can't talk to people without understanding where they come from. Um, so uh, again, one of the lessons I've learned, I think, is when you're dealing with with people on the spectrum or anybody for that matter, it's really important to include them in the process as much as they are comfortable being included in planning and attendance at events and rituals, um, in finding opportunities that surround the death uh, or the loss But again, to recognize that different people have different comfort levels, not to assume, but to uh, but to listen to the person, to offer options, to offer choices, to offer support and and to help them maneuver how they want to interact and the help that they think you might be able to provide or that they, they don't need that help. Thank you. How about you, Alex? For me, it's I learned that you. You know, they have to want to help. You can't help others if they if they can't help themselves. A good example is I uh, didn't really meet him, but I'd heard about a man and he lost his wife in a mudding and he became consumed by his grief. He and it drove him to vengeance. And eventually, as he finally, after years of fi- of trying to find the guy, he did. He found him and had his chance, but he realized staring this guy down that I, what he had lost, he had lost, he had thrown away his family, his business, all of it. He had lost everything in pursuit of his revenge. And he decided to take the high road and try and go back and fix, recover what he had lost. But again, that's an example of you can't help others unless they can help and want to help themselves. They have to want to help with their grief and their problems in general. Yeah, that we can't force our support on other folks if they aren't feeling open to what we might have to provide. And it sounds like with the Autism and Grief Project, you all have created a variety of different aspects for people to connect with and plug into and hear different stories so they may find something that feels like it resonates for them. So as we kind of come to the end of our conversation, um, would one of you be willing to just share what the Autism and Grief website is? I'll put it in the show notes, but sometimes it's nice for listeners just to hear it. Uh, You can find the website at autismandgrief.org and plug in any browser, Chrome, Mozilla, Firefox, whatever you want, and you'll pull it up. You'll be directed to the website. Great. Well, autismandgrief.org listeners. And again, I'll put that in the show notes so you can find it. But yeah, Dr. Doka, Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for the work you've done on this project, first of all, and second for coming on Grief Out Loud today to talk with us about it, uh, to share this information with listeners. I'm really grateful for both of you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, I I would want to also say thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I think it's important that this message gets out. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, thank you both. And listeners, you know, you hear me say this each and every time, but thank you for being part of the community, for listening to the show, for sharing episodes with people who might be interested in what we are talking about here. You can head to our website, D-O-U-G-Y dot O-R-G, where you'll find lots of free downloadable resources like tip sheets, activity sheets, information about our local programming, and each and every episode of Grief Out Loud. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can email me at griefoutloud at dougie.org. Excited as always to share that our podcast is sponsored in part by the Chester Stephan Endowment Fund. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us again next time.